uploading the virus. Eagle One, the package is being delivered. Hello out there on the internet, I am Matthew Galt, and this, this is Cyber. We're living through the end of something. Facebook is the site where your older family shares racist memes, Twitter seems only capable of talking about itself these days, and Instagram, it can't compete with TikTok. What started with Friendster and MySpace, social media, once felt like a totalizing force on the internet. Now it's dying. According to motherboard writer Edward Unguiso Jr., Social media isn't dying, it's dead. So what monster now struggles to be born? Well, he's here with us today to talk about that. Ed, thank you so much for coming onto the show again and kind of doing a part two of our Facebook conversation from last week. Yeah, no, really excited uh, to come on and talk with you about this. I am too. I was really, I really loved the last talk we had. And I was thinking earlier this week as we were putting together uh, like what we were going to do for cyber I was thinking, I really want to talk to you about like social media dying in general. And then I think Emmanuel or Jason was like, well, you know, he's writing this piece about that specifically. And I was like, perfect. By the way, there's a new piece on the site from Ed about uh, social media being absolutely dead. Um, let's, let's run through the basics here at the top. I know we talked about Facebook for 45 minutes last week, but um, what are the broad strokes of its kind of downfall very quickly? Yeah, so I think... You know, what really set this off is the investors punishing Facebook for its push into the metaverse. Um, the advertiser uh, revenue coming down partly because of Apple interventions and also because of the economy. And then Twitter's, you know, controlled demolition after uh, Musk took over. These are two of the major examples of social media. We have, you know, because Facebook owns Instagram as well, uh, is trying to do Reels as a copy of TikTok. Um, and Twitter is also another platform that is uh, overrepresented among, you know, public figures, uh, journalists, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, th I thought that it was a really good opportunity to kind of talk about what these platforms actually are, which is that, you know, there are advertiser platforms that offer some way for you to socialize with other people but not nothing that we would you know if we we're stepping back and thinking about it would actually call it socializing um and uh that this is a larger trend in the sense that we you know there are developments that are going on where it's a shift from or an attempt to find a way to shift from advertiser revenue reliance to you know generating or turning people into content creators and consumers of that content uh, to keep things more in-house, but e one way or another, you know, what we think of as social media networks and social networks are not, right? They're just attempts by these corporations to figure out ways for people to spend more of their time on there so they can generate uh, more data, use their services, uh, find more insights for more goods and services to provide them later on. And it's 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 been a, something that's been unraveling, but it also is an opportunity to think about, okay, like what do we actually want in a social media network um, and how if do we get there and is it possible to get there? Can you tell me a little bit more about what the original pitch was uh, for social media kind of as it was developing in those early days? Um, what was like on the cover of Wired that everyone said we were going to be doing? Uh, the everyone was well, it was under this idea that we were going to connect the world, right? That or you know that was the the premise of what Facebook was talking about. We we're going to connect the world um we're all going to be online building communities discovering ourselves uh finding nice good digital ways of expression and consumption and, and communication um there were various pitches and strategies to try to insist this was happening you know there's one early iteration that these social media sites would also allow people to find and cultivate political identities and movements and so they would be able to upend authoritarian regimes They'd be able to rally for political change in their communities, be able to achieve projects and, and, and some semblance of civic life that has been unavailable to a lot of people. Right. I want to highlight real quick there, sorry, just like two two points that I think in that sphere that that historically we may have forgotten a little about a little bit. Mm -hmm. There was the the Arab Spring, uh, which was like a huge part of kind of the the rise of social media as um, a political force for good. 
right? People were apparently, you know, people were organizing. They were going to throw over over these these autocratic regimes in these Middle Eastern countries. Um, things didn't quite go everywhere the way that that we thought it would. And the other one um, that I always thought was very it, kind of the other side of the Twitter story specifically that we don't really talk about uh, was there was a um, there was the mall shooting in Southeast Asia. And um, Twitter was used both by the attackers and the the people inside to share information in real time about where everyone was. Um, and you saw this really bizarre interplay in that early day. Um, you really saw um, how bad things could be. Uh, anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. No, you're right. I think th these are important things, right? One of the things that I think also is really... I tried to focus on some parts in the story, but there's so much and there's a lot of really rich terrain to cover because if you just zoom out from it, you can see how quickly these companies cycled through various um, narratives about how they would help people and then realize, oh, like either people realize that's not going to happen or reality crashed against the ad copy that everyone was being taught to recite, right? Like. The Arab Spring is a good example because what ends up happening is that we learn and realize pretty quickly that the internet is not just like some universalist project uh, that has a tendency that will affect the politics of governments and movement and social movements, but it, it, that it's you know an artificial construct, and and certain governments and certain you know politics can can are embedded in that right um, or can be deployed by it. Uh, to crush the scent, to black out communications, uh, to you know propagandize or you know radicalize certain populations or get them to believe certain things, right? So, on the on the one hand, like I think the early narratives all share this idea that tech, as for social media, is neutral uh, in that it doesn't have any sinister political uh, valence but that it also has a liberatory component to it and that if we just apply more of it we'll be freer um and i think then there's also the other aspect where that was also an attempt to prevent people from looking too closely and and thinking about scrutinizing or contesting or uh, resisting the way that certain companies were trying to roll out uh, data being you know privately held algorithms being privately held computing infrastructure and resources being privately held. And they've largely succeeded on all of those fronts, right? So the way that we think about the internet, the, thing, the way we think about social media is that it's supposed to be a communication network that's provided by corporations that you, that you can connect to one another by. They largely set the terms um, and, and, and most of it operates outside of view and outside of sight. Um, but, you know, as as things have developed, right, we've also started to realize that that has a lot of consequences. The types of tech that these companies are building, and the types of communities these companies want to build, and the types of relationships they want to cultivate are, are relatively, relatively superficial. They're, they're organized around being a consumer consuming or generating and producing for other people to consume. Uh, they're built on surveillance and kind of like watching other people, but also being like able to be read pretty easily by advertisers and other corporations. Uh, they're built on, you know, a very narrow contingency and, st and, and lineage of ideas and, and technologies that don't actually prioritize socializing and community. They prioritize profitability um, and behavior modification. And, and, and so what we have, what, we've, what we think about as social media I think one reason to think of it as dead or dying is because all of this is premised on advertisers, premised on a certain way, like a certain idea that people are going to be uh, using the platforms and staying on the platforms. And these things, for one reason or another, have fallen away or disintegrated or unraveled, especially with the emergence of alternative platforms for people to communicate on that are still embedded within the logic searching for profits. Tell me about these new models that are kind of disrupt. Oh God, I hate to use the word. These new models that are <laughs> supplanting uh, the old models. I mean, we're on Twitch right now. We're on YouTube. Mm -hmm. We're live. We're we're broadcasting. Yeah. Um, TikTok is you know the other one that's really taken over. What's going on? What what's what's the new thing that's coming? Yeah, I mean, there's there's been a there's been an obsession um, with or desire to do these sort of broadcast 
uh models or, uh where it's like you know even more of a locked into a one-to-one -one relationship with um whatever is producing or consuming content right um whether that is tw tiktok or twitch um and and their variants their various uh, models and variants and flavors of it you know maybe an algorithmic feed maybe a video um and, and cultivating a brand or identity that people come around in an audience that people rely upon. Um, but there's been a shift away from this idea that what we really need is like, you know, some whole of a thousand mirrors where you step into and you can go like, oh, that's what my crazy uncle's doing. You know, these are some advertisements I'm into. Here's like a marketplace I can go to. Uh, here's a dating service I can use. And they're all on this one platform. I think in some ways, that's a positive development, right? Because there was an attempt to, and a real desire to roll everything up onto one platform. Um, and the company as an intermediary can just pick off pieces of each transaction and turning everything into a transaction. But I think on another hand, it is a bit uh, concerning, right? Because it's still prioritizing um, social relations mediated by algorithms and inscrutable ones at that and ones that lock off our ability to learn more about ourselves, right? You, we don't get access to the data that these massive platforms generate that might yield insight into how people act and how people behave and how people move and the rhythms of cities or the rhythms of digital life that could create or be used to experiment with new ways of communication and relation. We don't have a chance also to even use the technical tools that these companies have developed, even if they are ones that are designed with profits in mind. Uh, you know, we don't have the ability to process the data. We don't have the ability to look at the data. We don't have the ability to hold the data. Um, all of this has been locked up in that system. And so there's been a shift to this broadcast model, but it still is also connected to that core logic that like, well, these are all private goods and privately developed goods. And so the public shouldn't reap the benefits of them. We're providing them with something and we're being generous about it because we're providing it for free in most instances, ostensibly. Do you think it was that kind of pitch that all of this was going to be free for the end user um, in terms of you weren't gonna fork over like a monthly subscription fee that kind mm -hmm. of helped us get into this place where we have turned over all this information to these people? Yeah, I mean, part of it is like, you know, all of these things are offered for free for a few reasons. You know, one is, of course, to cultivate users. Another is to, because in reality, the real product or some of the more profitable products end up being stuff they sell to other businesses, right? Um, or to create more products that might then be charged, you know, that you can actually charge money for, right? Or create different functionalities or additional features for those originally free products um, when you learn that, oh, people want this or that, or you can cultivate uh, your audience to desire this or that, you know, additional feature and then charge for it and lock it behind a paywall. So I think part of it is, you know, the free thing was always just a way, it was always going to be a temporary thing, right? Because um, these are profit-seeking enterprises. They're not benevolent guardians or stewards of, of, the, of the digital realm. Um, and so they're always looking for ways to sell these services, whether that means selling them using insights to figure out how to sell things to the Pentagon or to, you know, IBM or Intel. Um, it was always, there's always a, a way in which it's not actually free. The question I think has always just been, you know, when will consumers have to pay for it? And maybe the dream or the hope or the desire was that with the advertiser model, you could offer some set of core basic things, but that the really exciting stuff you would also not be not only be fine with paying for it, but be encouraged to and, and think nothing of it also. And we're, why do you think then that we collectively got tired of this? Where have all the um, posters gone? I think it sucks. <laughs> you know, I think on some level, I think that people do want, um, real ways to to build communities and connect with one another um that are not that are on, on, in digital worlds right right i mean you can do that in real life you can go out and talk to your neighbors you can go out and talk and join community groups you can go and work with friends and family you can do all of those things but i think some the people were hoping that the digital world would also provide something that either might be missing in their lives 
or that might complement it, right? Or it can be a separate and distinct experience, but one that still feel, feels as good as, you know, those real world analogs. And the reality is that it doesn't, right? I mean, we all figure out ways to have fun. We all figure out how ways to have fun with shit posting, right? Or with sharing things. And there's fun to be derived from that. I'm not trying to say that, you know, all of this is pointless and stupid and, um, you know, where we don't understand what it really means to connect to people, but that it's very clear, you know, th this is not the end all be all of connecting with uh, one another and building communities and relating to one another. And in fact, it is a form that is leaving people unsatisfied on some deeper level, but also that because it's so profit centric and situated in investors and shareholders and markets, it needs to have a level of growth that it can't, I don't think is sustainable. Um, if you're also trying to keep the veneer of we're building connections between everyone, because then it becomes very clear what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do is shoehorn people into a box or into a garden and then charging them to get out, charging them to move around, charging them to smell at the, ro the roses or pick at the, you know, the fruits. Um, and it's, so it's hard to juggle all these things at once if you're a company, um, especially if you're one that has horrible reputation like Facebook or one that's uh, being acquired by, uh, you know, an egomaniac like Musk, you know? Yeah, I think the, I mean, there's a lot of sad things about the Twitter Musk buy. One of the sadder ones to me is that now it's, that's the conversation on there every day. And it has been for like, what, now two weeks? Yeah. I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of him being the main character and dominating all of our psychic space every day. As I'm, um, you know, I live in South Carolina. I don't live around all of y'all. Uh, mm -hmm. So this, I'm doing a job and in a position that without moving to New York City or to the West Coast, like 10 years ago, this wouldn't have been viable. You couldn't have done this. Uh, not in, not at the level or in the way that I am now. And these relationships that I have digitally are very valuable to me and do, um, I found like a peer group in a way that I have not found other places in my physical, in my physical life. Um, and, but most of that is happening in private quarters, Right it's on Slack or it's in this broadcast model, you and I having this conversation now in front of an audience. Um, and it, that is materially different than fucking around with people on Twitter. Maybe a couple years ago we used to be doing that, but increasingly like everyone is just not on there anymore. Like we're maybe like listening to the conversation and posting a little bit, but it's, it's not the same. It has changed. Um, and I do, there is, especially because I, I do so much stuff that's like national defense stuff, uh, I do worry about losing that as an avenue to people because there's a lot of times that I can just DM people directly on Twitter uh, and get into conversations about like the news of the day and get quotes and things. And I worry about that going away. Um, so it is it does sit a little bit different where I am right now. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't build better things. Right. Uh, I'm just lamenting a little bit. Um, yeah, you know, I think this is a, that's a really great point you hit on. You know, I think this is true of so many things where startups have been able to create infrastructure that is necessary for some, beneficial and helpful for others, um, and should definitely have existed if it were public in one way or another, right? I, You know, like... The gig economy for me is always like one of the best examples of this because it also gets to like, what do you do about it, right? You know, food delivery, for example. One reason why it's able to spring up, of course, is that they have billions of dollars that they can just throw at getting drivers to go out and deliver food for people and billions that are spent on convincing people that what they need is almost instantaneous delivery of things. But there's also like a real need in that there are food deserts, right? There are people who have mobility issues. There are people who, for one reason or another, cannot also go and get food, specifically groceries, and, and will need or would like to have someone to, you know, to help them with that. And, and so, you know, ideally the solution would be we'd have a different food system, one that might maybe not be centered on supermarkets and, and, and sort of just-in-time aspect of uh, 
of, of, of getting food into them and, and, and the effects that that has on the food production system and, and figure out ways to have, you know, accessibility for people who need it and, and undermining the food deserts and reversing them so that everybody has access to the food, but we don't have that. And also that raises the question of, okay, like if you did do that sort of system, what do you do with all the people who were using food delivery as a job because they were underemployed or because they really did need extra money even if it's not providing that for them right and i think similarly with 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 twitter and and, and facebook and facebook's various products instagram whatsapp uh, more so um we need you know in for example in brazil in brazil you know whatsapp is is, is uh, communications infrastructure i mean a lot of people use it every single day and people in the united states also use it to keep in touch with people that are abroad right um so clearly we need something like this we should have it as a public infrastructure. How do we get to that point is one question. And also, what do you do in the meantime, right? Because we can't just, you know, get rid of it and then have nothing and then slowly fill up the void. Or we could, and maybe that's a possibility uh, that should be pursued. And maybe we are, you know, reluctant to do that, even if it might be a good option. But also, you know, like, what... um. What aspects of the system that we have now do we like and enjoy and want to keep? And some, and some, the things you talked about are things that are important, right? I think it's important to be able to just like reach anyone that you would like to, um, and and, and message them. That's so that's incredibly helpful. I've met so many great people in real life through Twitter. I've been able to do my job because I'm able to access people like that through Twitter and just hit them up and ask them for work. Uh, people who, you know, I could spend all day looking for the email and it's not anywhere online. Um, or maybe people who are not going to respond to their emails just because they're so full of them, um, or people who already follow me for one reason or another, right? The, the, these sorts of things, these social networks have sprung up and they filled some of the gaps that people did need in their lives. And they've also wedged themselves into gaps that something else might've filled better and created a need for them that will be hard to think through a solution to because of how expansive and pervasive these systems have become now. Wow, it almost sounds like you're saying we should address the systemic issues that create the need for many of these products and services <laughs> right. that we enjoy today. All right, I'm going to pause there for a break, <laughs> cyber listeners. Uh, speaking of products and services, if you are listening to the podcast, please stay tuned for this ad break. If you are watching us on the live stream at twitch.tv forward slash motherboard tv or youtube.com forward slash motherboard there is no ad break and we will be back immediately all right cyber listeners welcome back you are you, we are talking with edward Anguiso jr about uh, his new piece at motherboard social media is dead um another thing i wanted to bring up before we get into like systemic issues and the thing that we are groping towards with social media that we actually want to fix. Um, do you think that, as it did with so many other things, that the pandemic accelerated us being tired of this panopticon? Because it seemed to put all of this stuff under a lot of stress, right? I, I, think, I think that the, sur uh, the surveillance systems that have arose during the pandemic have definitely contributed to it. I mean... On one level, there's just been like a big pushback uh, to all sorts of lockdown practices and anything that seems to be related to them. All right, there's also been like some you know sort of low level and building resistance and, and pushback to surveillance, linked a little bit to the uprisings that happened in 2020, and also to frustrations consumers might have with these companies. And I feel like they probably mixed to create something that is is going to sustain itself. But I do also think that the pandemic also probably did help contribute to this sort of realization um, of isolation and atomization and loneliness, right? That some people were able to, you know, retreat into these online services and ignore or satisfy or push away, but that others were not. And all of this comes to a bear on one level and is gonna might manifest in, in interesting ways now that we have these openings provided to us by the glorious market in facebook's you know stock price collapsing and and musk you know generally failing or flailing 
in his attempts to figure out what to do with Twitter and, and, and pay for the debt interest that he incurred to own it. Um, so I definitely do think that like the pandemic has been a catalyst and an opportunity for a lot of things for people to think about what they actually, like, you know, what social media would we want? What's so, what's a, what would a social network actually look like? Um, and what are the things about the systems that we have now are, that are undesirable to them, that are unfulfilling or oppressive or restrictive or, you know, disgusting? I want to sit with disgusting for a second because I feel like there was also a lot of us living digitally and living online during the pandemic where we spent a lot of time with other people and realized that we didn't like them necessarily and we didn't want this connection and that this by the nature of the social media that that had been built we were kind of forced into these connections we didn't want um do you feel that yeah i think you know one thing all these platforms are designed largely to keep you engaged with uh, things that would be absurd anywhere else um so that you spend a little bit more time there um so that advertisers feel like they were getting more bang for their buck so that it's easier to you get a sense of uh demographics that can be carved up for various corporations and third parties um and so like there's an interest in forcing people to like sit there with their eyes you know held open and taped open but as you said you know it's not <laughs> It's not fun, uh, especially when you realize over, you know, day in, day out or week in and week out that you actually just don't like it or you don't like the people um, or that you're noticing things about using these platforms and services that you wouldn't have otherwise because your relationship was different before the pandemic. I definitely do think that, you know, there's there's disgust and it gets subliminated in a lot of ways. You know, some people have turned that disgust into anger. Um or into dissociation from the platform and with it. Some people turn that into hate, you know, and the hate can take many forms. You can, you, you can be petty like me um, and hound people you don't like, or, um, you know, maybe it turns into the frustration and anger with the entire thing itself. But I do think that, you know, disgust, uh, shame, frustration, uh, and, 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 and desperation, I think, are all, like, pretty powerful motivators that are underappreciated in terms of why individuals themselves on top of all the other issues we, we've hit on you know the economics of it or maybe the uh the actual inst structures themselves and and what they make the experience to be uh get people to say like i don't actually know if i want to keep using these things the way that i've been using them and so what is the opportunity point that we're at now what what do you think the thing that we want actually looks like and what does it do I think I think there's I think we have a sense of some things but not of everything right like I don't one open question is whether or not we need one social network or multitudes of them that do different things that maybe overlap and are redundant that um, are exclusive and, and so on and so forth right it's not clear to me that we should have one social network that does everything for everyone and you just have to go to different levels of it right um, it makes more sense to have something where, you know, after, or to maybe to step back and think about it this way, and that, you know, there are issues that everyone probably has in their own little neighborhoods, communities, uh, groups that they may uh, be a part of. And the solution to that, they require information that we don't currently have access to because, you know, maybe Google or, or Amazon has that information and not going to give it up in the, or the algorithms connected to it, right? It would be hard for us to figure out what problems are present and what solutions might, you know, we might want if we don't have the information in the first place. And so I think a huge part of figuring out and discovering what actual social networks we'd be interested in, whether those are social networks simply to connecting with people or to solve problems without a startup or a market being the vehicle for solving them or to solve them through political processes and so on, so on and so forth would require breaking open and making public, you know, the algorithms, artificial intelligence, the, the data there. And that would 
lead to an unfurling and in a, in a period of experimentation, I would hope, or should be used in a period of experimentation. But I think on the basic level, like, yeah, we, we know that people want to be able to communicate and build communities and do so in a way that doesn't feel like the, it's just really transacting and, and, and commodification at each level. I think also people, you know, are interested in or have shown interest in these sort of decentralized networks um, where communities can have their own flavor or blend of of people coming in and out of them. Uh, you know, a community that doesn't seem to be overrun with uh, bigots and hateful speech um, that uh, also seems to be like responsive to what people are actually interested in instead of, you know, force feeding things into them through an algorithm that's concerned with... Um, achieving certain ends or outcomes that are not about just ensuring people are socializing or, you know, building connections with one another. Um, but all of these things are, I think it's hard to pin them down partly because the ways in which we handle those things are pretty expansively articulated and they're, and they're just, you know, in a market logic and a capitalist logic. But I think, but I think that there have been people who talk, who've talked about steps that, you know, we might have later on, right? Like having protocols for some of these social media, um, for a social media network, right? Or having some, you know, better systems of content moderation or using algorithms in different ways. Like those would be interesting additives, but the, but the shape and the form of, of the, the networks themselves, I think is still remains to be seen. Do you think that then looks like, I'll, I'll articulate the dangerous, what I think is the dangerous uh, thing here, that that means a federally run Twitter, a federally run Facebook? Well, so yeah, that's also another thing, right? I don't think like the solution to uh, uh, tech companies that we don't like is not to you know, bring them under the arm of the state. <laughs> In fact, I think that would probably be the worst possible outcome um, or one of the worst possible ones uh, comparable with like if the companies did outright have political, like did outright run parts of our lives in some sort of cyberpunk dystopia, right? Um, because, you know, a state run, for example, like a state run Google, you know, um, do we want the state having access to all the information uh, in ways that make it just even more, uh, for lack of a better word, not transparent, right? Like already the, all the design, all the products, all the services, all the algorithms, all the institutions, all the features are designed in ways where, you know, we are not able to see much into what's going on, but they have pretty amazing bird's eye view of people's lives and, and the places in which they move through. Uh, I don't want, I don't think the state should have that um there are ways to make things public that are not solely the the government coming in and owning it right um specifically by having people who run these things like people who work in things people who are directly affected by them uh owning them making it public from a bottom-up way instead of having the state come in right um i think those would be more interesting models and places to start because there's a lot of privacy and civil liberty concerns if uh, the NSA is, you know, um, connected to some uh, federal Google or federal Amazon. But and I do think there are probably... Everything you love about big tech, but with also also a monopoly on violence. Uh, yeah, you know, this is... Uh, that's my secret dream, right? <laughs> the state should be able to, uh, to know everything about you and be able to use everything at once against you. I think... Um, and it, of course, it's going to be like a hard... The path through is not like some sort of simple one in the sense that we will probably, it's not going to be some sort of clean break and then you get to the perfect system. There will be there will have to be missteps and paths in the wrong direction because some things will be easier to achieve than others and some developments will happen easier than others, right? Like, it, it, it's easier to imagine the state coming in and running or intervening on some aspects of this in the march towards whatever ideal form we might want, right? But in the meantime, some basic things, I think it wouldn't be too wild if the state had its hand in would be, you know, breaking the privatized hold on com the ability to compute and the ability to compute data and the ability to experiment with the data and the ability to build things. You know, that shouldn't be the providence of just startups 
and tech monopolies, right? That should be a public thing, but we just don't have the means to do anything with it, even if it was a public thing. And so the state would have to get involved in building out that sort of infrastructure, and then we'd have to make sure they would, you know, solely own it, right? Um, so that we could uh, ensure it's not going to be used against us. All right. I also want to talk about another vision of the future that you've been privy to. Um, it's kind of funny. I don't even know where the drop-off point was, but we used to do a lot of reporting on Web3, crypto, NFTs, mm -hmm. um, all this kind of stuff that was, we were told, supposed to be the future of social media and the future of the web, and this is where things were going. Um, then like it felt like there was this kind of spectacle aspect to all this stuff because the stories were just so wild and everything felt so stupid. Um, and most people didn't like monkey JPEGs and like all this kind of shit. Right. Right. Um, so, but they're still be that vision is still being pushed. Um, and fairly recently you were at South by Southwest in Austin and for like what I would say a front row seat of the nightmare that, that is trying to be created. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that fork in the road? Yeah, you know, I think one possibility with with the with the unraveling of part of this advertiser driven, you know, platform model is that they're going to be desperate for other models, right? Because at the end of the day they need I think there's an understanding that, you know, the advertiser revenues and the ad tech are, are coming from an ad tech bubble that's not going to be there forever. They're, they're, on some level, there's a race to try to figure out how can we create uh, revenue streams that are going to outlast it. Um, the metaverse, of course, is one way. And the metaverse also op offers an opportunity to introduce crypto assets and, and digital assets of all sorts and transactions. As a way to say, oh, like you're enjoying life on another level, you know, isn't it great that you have an IMVU token now? Um, but at South by, you know, what you see is, or what I saw was, kind of people like, I, no one was excited except the people selling it. And most people were here there because they, you know, thought or heard that it's something they should come to or thought vaguely that it might offer new ways of connecting with other people. But again, the connections are still mediated and through transactions and markets. Um, but I think all of it is like, you know, let's figure out ways to overlay something in the real world with the shitty uh, recreation of it and a token um, and some transaction. Uh, that might, in one way or another, add some sort of transparency to ownership or or to disputes about the property, but are turning everything nonetheless into a property, an asset, um, a commodity, a transaction. And, you know, stepping away from that, I think one thing to ask is like, okay, like, let's say we do want to build some alternative social network. Do we want property to be like an integral part of it? Do we think that transactions have any place in social relations? Do we think, um, you know, you know, people trade things, people, you know, buy and sell things between one another all the time, but should social networks be explicitly organized around that idea and principle? Should they be modeled after ideas that come from the marketplace? Or should we try to figure out ways to avoid all of that and adhere closer to just um, non-market, you know, or non-market mediated, non-state mediated ways of connecting with one another. And I think that what you see at the South by is people who are interested in finding new ways of relating, and but committed to doing so within markets. But that's already the way that we are all familiar with or have been told is the future, right? By these large companies, they're just trying to do it in another way that will also happen to make a lot of them rich, right? Because there's an additional commodity on top of it that can be traded and speculated against. And I think that's also like concerning, right? I, we shouldn't be adding, we shouldn't have all of this stuff on the market anyway, but we definitely shouldn't introduce the risk of people losing their shirt or losing their lunch because, um, you know, someone uh, dumped shitcoin onto the market 
and and whatever they were dealing with is now worthless. Whatever community project they were dealing in is worthless. Or because there was a con artist who was involved in one part of it. Or because there was some esoteric trade or derivatives contract that happened in another part of the world that destroyed and blew up the value of whatever they were connected to. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me why you would want to bring all this sort of risk and speculation into the world, especially when the only people who will benefit guaranteed each time are you know, the already wealthy individuals who are trying to tell you that this is the future that will help you. Yeah. And also there's, there's something really sad about a lot of these crypto and NFT spaces, especially because they, a lot of them succeed by lying to the people that they're getting involved about this being a community. You, I, you know, I see that all like being in those discord groups, reading through their mm -hmm. messages, talking to them. These are people that bought what they thought was a token that would get them into a bigger world, a, a community of other people. Um, and it was always just about pulling the rug out from under them and absorbing them, like emptying their pockets for as much as possible, like every time. Um, and so even even in those spaces, uh, that's what people are grasping towards over and over again is some psych, some kind of sense of community and connection that these market mediated solutions aren't quite providing. Yeah, you know, I think and I think also like there there are real attempts by some people to say, well, you know, hey, look, if the market is the way that we're going to organize it, maybe we should maybe we can make a better one. You know, maybe we can make one that will work better because we have some insight into like what we're not getting or what we should get or what other people should get. You know, um, I think that it is a dangerous game uh, and one that should always be, you know, when someone is introducing a new thing for you to buy or, or sell, you should, you know, reach for your wallet because and, and they're almost certainly just trying to make money off of, you know, either you buying it are you selling it and giving them liquidity to exit, right? Um, or you you selling it to someone else who comes in and, you know, increases the value and then you can have the liquidity to exit. I, th I you know, crypto is, a, I'm sympathetic to some of the people who at the end of the day really do just want some sort of community. I mean, and you can see it, but it is also incredibly depressing that it's like, you know, we all love these ugly ass apes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> We all love like these children's drawings that are of clouds or these, you know, horribly rendered recreations of Looney Tunes characters, but in outfits, you know, like it's, um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not what I, there are a lot of things you can organize a community around. And I would just hope that, pe you know, people don't do it around these sort of horrible pieces of, of, of content because they're not even really art but um i think also at the same time that does just speak to like one desperation and two uh, the the greed you know that we're also starting to see come in and fill the holes here right you know maybe zuck maybe musk have i mean no i shouldn't even give it that to them i was gonna say you know maybe they had some desire in one way or another to build something but i don't even think that's true i, I, I i'm just i'm not I don't believe people who are in the position of like selling someone something when they say that, you know, what I really want to do is build a community for everyone. I want to build a town square. Maybe people who come to work for them, I could believe that. Maybe people who come to use the product, I would believe that. And those are the people that we should, you know, be thinking about. What would, you know, what do they need? What do they want? What would help them as opposed to, you know, how do we provide some competitor to um zuck's you know vision of having of strapping a heavy computer to your face or how do we provide some alternative to you know like doom scrolling you know i it, it's really like what are those things what are those things doing that's hitting people and what are the systemic issues that are generating a need that gets satisfied in the short term by these things so loneliness yes <laughs> how do <laughs> right. we how do we fix loneliness <laughs> Right. I mean, yeah, loneliness, I think, I think, but I think also, and, and, and this is the problem where it's like, you know, almost everything is hostile to like people just in like freely and spontaneously and organically connecting with one another. 
right? Because more often than not, when people do that, they realize how horrible things are, you know? Uh, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to, you know, for civic groups and for community groups and, and, and centers of community life to become political. But I also think that it's pretty easy for them uh, to act in ways that are antithetical to markets, right? I mean, uh, everyone talks all this sh nonsense about how markets are efficient and markets re require rational investors. Well, markets really require people being corralled, you know, uh, from point A to point B, or lots of money being spent to convince other people that people can be corralled from point A to point B. Um, and I think that a lot of these things, a lot of these groups, groupings, institutions, that would be amicable to real social media or to real social connections and real social networks are not to markets and, and, and to the billions that are spent on modifying people's behavior so that they are better consumers uh, and, and more reliable uh, you know, um, actors in some market. All right, sir. I think that that is a good, well, not a good, that's a depressing place to leave us. <laughs> So I'm going to take us out there. Uh, Edward Anguiso Jr., if people want to develop a parasocial relationship with you, where can they go? <laughs> they can go on Twitter, uh, where I'm there at Big Black Jacobin, and you can read my work on uh, Vice at Motherboard. Thank you so much for coming on to Cyber. If you like the show, please follow us on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash motherboard or motherboard tv and twitch.tv forward slash motherboard tv you will get notified when we go live and you can watch commercial free versions of uh the podcast and even shoot us a couple questions comments i do sometimes read them out on the air thank you everybody for tuning into the stream and thank you for listening to the podcast uh we'll be back a little bit later this week we're going to be talking to samantha cole another more motherboard writer who's got a new book out about uh how sex changed the internet and what the future of that thing is. It's fantastic. I can't wait to talk about it. See y'all later this week. Bye. Yeah.